Is now there are, whenever you have something like that, you can substitute one, there's extra subtests, you can substitute one in two areas. So on this one, I went ahead and had him do this, and it was a bad score. But I, I, no way I could get him to do that, because his hands, you know, he was having to use his left hand. And then on the visual perceptual stuff, I couldn't have him do the blocks, so I just had to do the visual things where he just tells me, you know, what's missing or what's alike. So sometimes you have, you can, but that's still a, a legitimate way to get a, a full scale and a, you know, all the factor scores. And I was so surprised I was taken aback by that when he came in with his arm in a sling. I thought, whoa, I got to shift gears and, you know, try to get some information here. But, and that's, is that all spelled out for like a student with cerebral palsy right in the manual? Yeah, well, now someone like that uh, who has that problem, uh, you would probably, you, we've seen kids before, and we usually do the, the verbal parts to measure abilities. So we'll just do verbal parts or tasks of visual perception that don't require a motor response. So we just leave the motor part out of it. We may do some just for, just to let the person or the parents know, well, even with this problem, he could still do this or, or she could do that. But the valid part of it is only the verbal part or the pointing part or the, you know, the speaking, you know. So, okay. And then I was gonna talk about assessment for dyslexia and like I say, people often say it, especially in public schools, I hear some people say, well, we can't you know, assess for dyslexia because that's a medical diagnosis. And it's really not. I mean, I, I don't think I could find a doctor in the, in the Twin Cities that has reading tests in his office. <laughs> Have you ever seen it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, uh, and when you think about dyslexia, it's, it's about a reading problem that's unexpected you know, based on the kid's age or intelligence or, you know, even his background, and it's just not expected. And usually it's most often characterized by evidence of a phonological weakness. And that means, you know, problems with the sound symbol relationships. And like I said, I've seen some reading specialists who have started doing their own testing for dyslexia, and I think they're really pretty good. You know, the things I see, they're really good. Um, now some of this little bit in the next, on this sheet, this page and the next page is from uh, Sally Shaywitz's book. Are any of you familiar with that book? Yeah. Great book. <laughs> Just a great book. And so, and, but this is the way we do it. This is the way we're, we've been doing the testing for years and it's sort of the way even the Woodcock-Johnson tests of achievement are structured. But whenever you test for dyslexia, you of course have a kid read single words. I just give them a list of words that start out very easy and then they become progressively harder until they reach a ceiling. And then even more importantly you have a student read nonsense or made up words. And that's to see if they can apply phonic rules um, whenever they encounter new words. Because if you just gave them real words, they may have just memorized those words from overexposure. Which is okay. I mean, you have to do that with some words. But they may just rely on their good visual memory without having the phonic skills. And so, you know, these tests, this nonsense words test how well they can sound out words or, you know, attach sounds to the, the symbols or letters on the page. And that's referred to phonological, phonologic decoding. And, you know, the ability to read nonsense words is considered to be, the, you know, the best measure of how well kids can decode words. So I know kids always think it's weird, and parents always think it's kind of weird, but it's really one of the very best measures. And I, you know, Woodcock Johnson even has a subtest where you spell nonsense words. You have them spell, you know, words like that, and lat, and bip. I, for some reason, I find that kids can often do well on that test. They just seem to be able to do it, you know, <coughs> even if they can't read. But um, uh, anyway, that's. The word attack subtest is the best measure. And of course, you should, you should also measure reading comprehension. And what you'll find, especially with kids who have good verbal abilities, is that they can often comprehend pretty well, even though they can't read very well. 
Even though they substitute a lot of words, they still get the gist. So that's kind of a common pattern you see. And they can make good use of context, probably because they've had to make good use of context, because they've had trouble with word recognition. Uh, and of course, oral reading should always be a, a part of it, as far as reading actual passages or stories. Um, and you, that way you can measure accuracy, rate, and comprehension. Uh, also, there's tests that just measure how quickly you can read individual words. They're just timed measures. And, you know, for 45 seconds you have them read actual words, and for 45 seconds have them read nonsense words. But, I mean, that's a good measure, but the best measure is to have them read aloud, time them carefully, record their errors, see what kinds of errors they're making. Um, and then, of course, you should also measure spelling skills to see what kind of spelling errors they make. And uh, we talked about the spelling of nonsense words. Usually what it tells you is that, well, they do have some knowledge of sound symbol associations that they can spell those words, but they, it hasn't translated as well into the actual reading. So when they're spelling, they're thinking about it more carefully and you're saying it to them, so they hear all the sounds. So it's good to measure spelling as well. And you know, some I know Sally Shaywood says in her book that you know, uh, evaluation of intelligence isn't always necessary, but I think it's good to look at the abilities to see if there's other, you know, if, if there's weaknesses in ability areas that could also be playing a part, like working memory, processing speed. Um, and then you can actually evaluate for the presence of phonological deficits. Um, <clears throat> and by that I mean giving tests that don't directly measure reading, but have them engage in activities related to reading. Uh, for example, you uh, would have them do, uh, okay, give them a phonological processing task. <clears throat> and you'd have them do blending without no reading involved. None of these have reading involved. You're just playing games with them, and you give them individual sounds. Can they blend the sound? Like if you say k, at, can they blend that? Or <coughs> elision, if you say, uh, you say things like, say the word chat. Now say it again, but don't say ch. And they have to say ch. <coughs> or you omit the end of the word. And so you, and then you sometimes omit uh, sounds or letters within the word. Um, so to see if they understand where sounds occur in words and they can mentally sequence and think that through. And also auditory sequencing, you have them repeat things in the same order. Rapid naming, you have them quickly name letters and um, numbers as fast as they can. And even though they seem like really simple-minded tasks, they the research shows they have very strong correlation with the ability to read, or whether or not a kid may have uh, reading problems down the road. And rapid naming, by the way, relates to retrieval, how quickly you should be able to <coughs> retrieve phonic rules from memory. And often kids who have difficulty with rapid naming um, are slower readers. It takes them longer to, when they read a word and they see TH, it takes them a little longer to come up with the, you know, the sound to pronounce. So, and then you also have them do rhyming tasks. You say, give me a word that you know, rhymes with spot. Or um, uh, you do segmentation. You ask them to um, break a word down into parts. You say, here's this word, and I break it into parts. Or you do isolation tasks where you ask them to tell me What's the beginning sound in this word? What's the final sound? What's the middle sound? And often, so these phonological processing tasks, these are measuring the underlying abilities related to learning to read. And there's some tests that just have every one of those tasks in them. So you could give that entire test to help diagnose with dyslexia. Because what you're measuring is the student has 
If they had problems in all or a lot of those areas, you could say they have phonological processing weaknesses, which are <coughs> contributing to their reading difficulties. But sometimes if a kid is young enough, a good way to teach a kid to read, if they're like four or five or six, well actually it's good practice to do with every kid based on their research, is play these kinds of games with three-year-olds or four-year-olds and just play these very kinds. There's, uh, there's actually you know, materials that have activities